So by going and essentially becoming an outsourced team member for our developer, I said to them, look, I'm going to go raise this money, but you're going to pay me the fee, not the client. So it's very efficient from the client standpoint, and it's very efficient from the developer standpoint because they're paying me a few percent, the same thing I used to charge a client basically. Um, but they deal with me. I handle all that. I raise all the money for them. And on the flip side, the investor is not paying a fee. So it's very efficient for them unless we're doing some deep planning for them, that type of stuff. And I'll just charge a flat planning fee. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Dana Cornell is a certified investment management analyst and certified financial planner. His passion is to take the uncertainty out of investing and provide consistent returns his clients can count on. Dana, welcome to the show. Sam, thanks for having me, my friend. Absolutely. Pleasure. The pleasure is mine, Dana. There are three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show in 90 seconds or less. Can you tell us where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? I'll give it my best shot. So I'm from south of Buffalo, New York, a little town called Olean. Um, started pretty typical, you know, middle class family. My father is excavation contractor. My mom was a kindergarten teacher. Didn't really come from money. Didn't know many people that had money. Um, so I started knocking on doors to start talking to people and let them know what I did for a living and see what they needed and how I could help them. That turned into 17 years later, uh, fortunate to be recognized on the Forbes under 40 list for advisors in the country, best in the state, all that good stuff. Managed about 1.4 billion with my team and my group at Morgan Stanley. And about two years ago decided you know, I didn't feel like I was doing the best job for my clients, which I'm sure we'll talk about why and how, and uh, decided to literally walk away from that, um, which, as I told you briefly before we started, they asked they, they asked me if I needed mental health counseling, because that's not typically the, the move in that industry when you reach that level of success. Um, but I felt strongly about it. I, I knew there was a better way to build wealth. I knew my ultra wealthy clients did it a different way. And uh, so that's how Cornell Capital Holdings was born. Wow. Okay. Let's, 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 let's do dive into that a little bit walking away. Cause that 1.4 billion in assets under management, those are hard earned clients. I mean, getting people to put their accounts with you to trust you with their finances. I mean, that's a, that's a tough road to hoe. It is. It is. Yeah. And, and walking and walking away. And, and when you leave, you leave all your clients behind. Essentially. Yeah, you have to, yep. yeah, you have yep. to. Mm -hmm. No wonder, no wonder they asked you, do you need, uh, I mean, you spent 17 years just, I mean, beating your head against the desk, getting this done. And now you're like, okay, I gotta go. <laughs> like I'm done. Yeah. Has, have you, have you, uh, let me, let me see if there's a nice way to ask this. <laughs> Since you had that move, when you, when you made that move, was it just like, yes, this is it. This feels amazing. I'm so glad I did that. And you've never looked back. Are you asking if they were right, if I needed that mental health counseling? I don't know, but no, no I wasn't asking that. But. <laughs> no, uh, I have not looked back and I'll tell you why. So, you know, being a traditional financial planner, it's funny. Everybody would always ask me, what's your number? What's the number you need to retire? And it's all relative to what you need, right? And what you spend. Right. But if you reverse that, and I talk a lot to my clients now about the reverse financial plan. If you start with income first and buy your time back by buying passive income and being very efficient with it and both not paying tax as best you can and fees to eat away at your your income and your capital, you know, that's a it's a much different situation. So when I experienced that for myself, investing in real estate syndications, and then made the decision that, hey, this is how my ultra wealthy clients have built wealth. This is something I truly you know, I had two little boys show up around the same time, you know, they're five and, and soon to be four now it makes, it just puts a different perspective on things. Maybe really reflect internally. Hey, am I doing the right thing? So I feel great about what I'm doing. And I didn't, you know, so the answer is no, I never look back. And that's the main reason why, you know, I truly believe in how we're doing it now. And you got to feel good about what you're doing at the end of the day. You know? Oh, you do undoubtedly, undoubtedly. Tell me, so what, when you, when you launched out on your own, how did you decide and, and what did you decide to focus on? Cause you're basically doing the same thing. You've started your own, your own, um, you know, financial planning firm. 
but now yeah. you can you you can call the shots because now you can tell your clients and you can advise your clients hey you could invest in this multifamily syndication or whatever it is i mean is that the gist exactly of it? so so you know quite simply to sum it up instead of being a more of a generalist we're just more of a specialist i focus on your your income replacement and tax efficiency strategies um we're not working with all of your capital typically um some we do but most we don't and um, it just allowed me to be laser focused in what we're doing and what we're offering. So to answer your question, you know, I had started researching and interviewing different developers. And there was a gentleman I knew that, that had a similar firm. He started 20 years ago. And quite simply, they would partner with best in class developers in different asset classes of real estate. And I started with self-storage. It's the most, I did that because historically as an asset class, it's the most consistent, right? Um, that's where I started, found a really good team to partner with there, convinced them that they could do more projects. If I added fuel to the fire and handled investor relations on their side, you know, and I help coach a lot of developers now to structure their raise, how to find the right investors, how to do all that stuff on one side. And then on the other side, I'm profiling high net worth individuals looking for passive income and tax deductions and matching them to the right projects and teaching them about the risks and, you know, where that fits into their portfolio. So that's how it's come together. Got it. I want to hear state of the market and interest rates and all of those things and kind of what you're seeing on the development side, maybe as part B here of this uh, show to here today, but maybe before we get there, you, you're, you said you're only handling portions now of people's income. I think probably previously you're handling the majority of what your clients yeah. had and now you're only taking portions of it how do you how do you structure that i mean i think about that just go okay how do you how do you structure it such that obviously you get paid because you got to still feed your family uh, and i mean without doing fund to funds and things like that how, how does that process work with you as an advisor helping your clients yeah so great question so the beauty of it is you know i had, I had worked previously on managing as much of your assets as i could doing a financial plan, charging an annual management fee, very typical wealth management structure. Um, that's fine, but I thought there was a better way to structure the whole thing. So by going and essentially becoming an outsourced team member for our developer, I said to them, look, I'm going to go raise this money, but you're going to pay me the fee, not the client. So it's very efficient from the client standpoint, and it's very efficient from the developer standpoint because they're paying me a few percent the same thing I used to charge a client, basically. Um, but they deal with me. I handle all that. I raise all the money for them. And on the flip side, the investor is not paying a fee. So it's very efficient for them unless we're doing some deep planning for them, that type of stuff. And I'll just charge a flat planning fee. Um, so it makes it much more economically viable. And the reason I say we deal with typically a portion of their money, alternative investments are not appropriate for all of your cash, right? We have liquid alternatives. But you can do that stuff anywhere. You know, I'm not going to charge you 1% to manage your cash and, and fixed income exposure. It doesn't make any sense where rates were, especially, right? Um, now we can talk a lot about rates if you'd like. But, you know, I'll tell them, look, I can do that for you, but you can do it elsewhere just as efficient and cheaper, All right? Let me add value where I really truly add value. And that's usually for about half, you know, 40 to 50% of people's liquid net worth. That's, that's really interesting. Cause I mean, a lot of times what we'll see in the, I mean, you're a capital raiser in its own right, just with a different kind of spin on things. I and mean, you're doing this through, cause you have your licenses, you are, you know, I don't, I don't know what they all are. I've probably yep. at this point forgotten a lot of those. Yeah. There's a lot of probably re reporting. I've had too many FINRA licenses over the years and I've kind of blacked out a lot of that. Yeah. Basic yeah. Brain. It's like, I forget a lot of that. Um, but I mean, you, you have some compliance things to keep up with and reporting things. Maybe they're different than what somebody who doesn't, isn't licensed. So how does, how does that process work and why have you chosen to go the route you have in bringing capital to deals? Yeah. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. I appreciate it because I think it's something that sets, sets me apart. So from the world I came from, right, I'm a fiduciary based on my licenses and my certifications right. to the client. A lot of people, and I saw, I experienced it myself, you know, going into syndications or a real, a private investment of any kind, doesn't matter if it's a private investment, 
it's private, meaning the information is not as accessible as buying a publicly listed stock or bond. Sure. So how do you, if you don't spend all of your working hours and have 20 years of experience like we bring to do the right due diligence, to make sure it's the right fit, and then figure out how does that fit into your world as an investor, what percentage, how much you should invest in each project, so on and so forth. So I blend both of those worlds. You're right. On one side, I'm a, I'm a capital raiser for the developers. I just make it easier for them because I'm one source of capital and I handle all things investor relations and, you know, it makes it streamlined for them. They can go further faster, but I'm really, I focus more on the investor side and being that guide and that bridge to making the right decision. So you're not getting burned. You're not over-concentrated. You know what the risks are. Um, I think there's a lot of value being that guy in the middle, you know? How, how when you're looking, cause I'm thinking about this. And if you're looking at someone's portfolio, you, what you, how, how many deals do you guys have as of available deals to your clients at a time? Because maybe one type of an investment may work for me. I may exactly. want, you know, I may want something, you know, in my stage in life, like I really don't want necessarily the cash flow right now. I want it to double or triple in the next five years, whereas somebody who's 75 may want to just clip the coupon. Yep. So how do you have the, like, what, what does your set number of opportunities look like at any given time? Yeah. So, you know, it's a moving target. It kind of honestly comes by, by opportunity in our underwriting process of what deals come through. You're right. So I'm always looking, I spend a lot of my time profiling deals, doing my underwriting, taking it through our process to have different offerings. And we have a menu of probably right now between registered fund offerings that we have access to that you would typically have to put a million or more in directly to have access and you can get for a much lower minimum with us um, and the true direct private syndicated deals. You know, we probably have a menu of 10 different options at any point in time, wow. but really of the true privates, two or three going at one time that are more growth focused, cash now, cash later, have your tax advantage. Um, trying to hit the main points there and yeah. give them enough opportunity. You know, how, how do you stay in front of, maybe you have just have an amazing team behind you, but how do you stay in front of that many different opportunities and kind of, I mean, cause that's a lot of communication. That's a lot of, I mean, just, just reporting back to investors, the status of those opportunities and where they're going and what the different moving pieces are. Like, how do you manage that whole communication flow? It's leverage. You know, I couldn't do it myself by any means. So it's the the old who to do the how story. Right. Um, you know, I, I lean on a lot of other professionals to help me with due diligence, to give me third kind of third party non-biased opinions on deals. Uh, my team here is handling an awful lot of investor relations and um, summarizing and synthesizing all that information. So I can then take it you know, and efficiently kind of put my spin on it and relate it to the investors. Um, so I can disseminate that to help them make a good decision and keep them updated on what's going on. Right. No, I think that's great. Tell me a little bit. Let's, let's, let's go to part B here of this, of this uh, podcast and, and talk about the um, kind of the state of the economy, what you guys are seeing, especially because it sounds like you're doing a lot of development stuff. It's not that you've mentioned the word development a couple of times. So it sounds like that's kind of one of the niches yeah. that you've picked. Uh, yeah. what's, what's going on in that world? Give us kind of the, the, the breakdown of where we are and maybe where you see things going. Yeah. So big question, man. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always contrasting and comparing what I call traditional investments, publicly traded stocks and bonds to private alternative offerings. Um, we could talk about stock market and all that stuff all day long, but I think it's no secret that that market is going to fluctuate. It's going to go up and down. We're coming into an election year. It's going to have good periods. It's going to have bad periods. At the end of the day, it's consistency of returns and the predictability of those that, that truly um, changes the game for people. And that's what you see the ultra wealthy focus on. So when I'm looking at projects, I'm looking at what is the predictability that one, of course, our principal is protected. Two, if it's an income producing project, and that's why I like a lot of our self-storage development that where, where I started. Um, we're building in areas where they have three times the amount of demand 
We're partnering with publicly traded companies to run, operate, and, and eventually acquire those properties. They've checked the box that it all makes sense ahead of time from their standards. So you're borrowing some credibility from a publicly traded company and their team and their resources, right? Instead of, hey, I'm going to I'm gonna go out and build my own storage facility and I like this spot because I'm biased towards it. And, you know, I think this makes sense and I hope it works. No, there's a lot more going into the research before I'm going to put my name on an offering and put my own money in it because we're doing that too. You know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting anything that we don't have our own capital in um, one way or another, you know? So go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, so I think, you know, that then leads you to a path of, okay, if it's private investments over public investments, where, right? Real estate, there's a bunch of different flavors of private real estate. Rates going up so fast. Um, you know, one of the things we did was underwrite all of our projects to historical interest rates. Hmm. Commercial real estate historical rates are about six and a half percent, give give or take. Right. Um, that's what we underwrote that to plus a cushion. A lot of projects I saw over the last two years were underwriting to current rates plus a cushion in their pro forma. Well, I have 20 years experience of seeing rates fall. I know they're not going to stay low. That's the new normal for people, but that's not our reality. That's not the historical average. We haven't been there in the last 30 years. We were for the last few, but if you're not building in that cushion, you're going to see a lot of trouble in a lot of asset classes within real estate and a lot of individual projects. So, you know, those are some of the things we're looking at. That's why you've heard me mention development, because I think you can kind of pick and choose your spots there. Um, not to say there's not issues there. It comes down to the project and the developer at the end of the day. Right. No, absolutely. What, you've mentioned uh, a couple of things, and I want to kind of hear your thoughts on this. You said the two things that you're really working with people on is income replacement and tax abatement. Mm -hmm. On the income replacement side of things, how, because of where interest rates have been climbing, like how, how have you combated that in its own right? Because preferred returns of whatever they were, 7%, 6% in 2019 were pretty attractive, but 7% in 2023 is like, okay, I can get five and a half at the credit union. So exactly it. You're and I can get it out tomorrow. It's not tied up for five years. So how did, how, what are you doing on that front to kind of structure things creatively? Yeah. So, you know, it's, I talk to developers about this a lot. So it's knowing your marketplace and knowing where you're at in this market cycle. Mm -hmm. And you're right. So now the risk-free rate of money, you've got to beat five, 5% 5 to right. make it even worth your time to get out of bed. Correct. So how do you change your offer and how do I find offerings that are more income focused and more of a, Really right now, a lot of what we've been doing is not as much growth focused. Hmm. It's cash flowing um, properties or soon to be cash flowing properties at enough of a of a current yield to make it worth, you know, it is the eight, nine, 10% income. Right. Um, and it's all looking at other asset classes, you know, real estate's great, but you got to keep your eyes open for everything. We do a lot of small business acquisition as well. Um you move to where the risk isn't as much and in turn that creates more opportunity. And right now it's higher income tax deduction and less growth type strategy uh, that seem to work right now. Right. Oh man. That's really, really cool. I love, I love what you've done here, Dana. This is really cool. The, the, just the, I mean, leaving big business, leaving a $1.4 billion portfolio of assets under management to go do what you really feel in your heart is the right thing to do, I think is, is, uh, admirable. And, you know, it's, uh, it's cool to watch, just see what you've done that on that side of things. Let's talk, let's talk staff building teams, those sorts of things. We touched on this slightly, but when you venture out on your own and do in law and it, maybe you already knew you're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to step out. This is going to be a home run. I have no, I don't think this would be a problem at all, but, or maybe there was some apprehension as you went out on your own and said, all right, we're going to launch this thing. What's it been like building a team around you to help you guys run your day-to-day -day operations? Yeah, you know, it's it's been an interesting learning curve. Um, when I left, I thought I could be, I thought I'd be more of a, and I still am, but it's I thought it'd be more of a lifestyle type situation. Hmm. Kind of a, you know, one man band, limited staff, that type of thing. What surprised me, even though I knew and had proved concept, was the demand for people looking for the two main issues I solved for. 
you know, income replacement, passive income, buy cash flow, don't pay tax on it. That's our core thesis, right? <clears throat> so the amount of investors reaching out, wanting help with that, whether it be on the planning side or just implementation of that was overwhelming. So Morgan Stanley taught me about, I mean, that's the beauty of a corporate structure. You see, you see how that works. You see how teams are built and organizational structure, um, but it's also done for you. So I had to spend a lot of time <laughs> increasing my learning curve and finding the right people. And it took a while. You know, we went through a few people that I thought were the right spots initially. And initially they probably were, but the business evolved so quickly, you know, we kind of had to increase capacity and increase um, the capacity of our people to fulfill that spot. So yeah, man, it's been a, it's been a learning curve and it's an, uh, continuation of that learning curve as we continue to grow. Right. No, that's cool. That's cool. Thank you for taking the time to share that with us, Dana. And thank you all for taking the time to come on the show today and just tell us what motivates you, what makes you get out of bed and why you're excited about doing what you're doing right now. I think it's awesome. And I, and I really appreciate it too, because man, the number of, of financial advisors and financial professionals I talk to that are just, their hands are tied. I yeah. mean, they're, they're like, man, I love what you're doing. I love, you know, I love that private real estate, private syndication, private business, any of those types of investments. They're like, well, we can't touch with a 10 foot pole. Mm -hmm. we're, just, we're just forbidden from, uh, from doing so. So thanks uh, for stepping out and doing what you're doing. This is great. If our listeners want to get in touch with you and learn more about you, what is the best way to do that? Uh, our website, Cornell Capital Holdings with an S.com. You can join our investor network. Um, there's a button on there. You can email me directly. It's just Dana at Cornell Capital Holdings with an S.com. Um, Tim, thanks for having me on, man. This has been fun. Thanks for letting me tell my story. Absolutely. Thank you for telling it. Again, Cornell Capital Holdings. We'll make sure we include that there in the show notes so you get the spelling on that exactly correct. Cornell Capital Holdings.com. Dana, thank you again. The pleasure was all mine. Thanks, Sam. Hey, thanks for listening to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you can do me a favor, and subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform it is you use to listen. If you can do that for us, that would be a fantastic help to the show. It helps us both attract new listeners as well as rank higher on those directories. So appreciate you listening. Thanks so much and hope to catch you on the next episode.